has made, let us rejoice and be glad that we are transformed in Christ. Share the hope that we have. What a great day it is for us to be gathered together to worship this morning. Uh, you'll notice our gospel lesson uh, is the parable of the wise uh, and foolish virgins, which talks about uh, having enough oil uh, in your lamp and everything. Well, I, I uh, turned my car on this morning and I was on E. <laughs> but I was prepared enough to get to church. So it was all it was like, we're okay. We're okay. So it's great to great to be with everybody uh, this morning as we worship our Lord and as we prepare uh, for uh, the end of the church year. Uh, our readings over the next few weeks are going to prepare are going to focus us uh, on Jesus' uh, second coming. And so we'll hear actually this morning from the prophet Amos uh, a little bit more about what he thought about uh, the day of the Lord. So uh, we'll look at that this morning. A uh, very warm welcome to any visitors and guests who are with us. Know you're always welcome uh, to be with us here at Holy Cross, and we're glad to have you here. Uh, we just have a few uh, words of announcements before we get started. First off, you'll notice uh, for one of our communion hymns, uh, we have uh, an insert. Uh, so this, uh, so for the communion hymn, you'll, the first communion hymn you'll sing is an insert. Uh, we've got a strategic planning committee meeting uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, and if you uh, aren't, or if you have been on the strategic planning committee, you're invited to be there. If, also, if you're interested in being a part of, as a part of the strategic planning committee, you're welcome to join for that uh, as well. Um, there's no Bible class on Tuesday this week as we have a circuit meeting. And the only other thing I want to mention, I think. Uh, well, there's two other things. Uh, we've got the Thanksgiving service coming up uh, on Tuesday, November 21st. So that's uh, not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Uh, and then also next week, Sunday, we will be having, uh, there will be a short meeting after the service for uh, anyone interested in upcoming Christmas events. This is especially for those who uh, haven't maybe been able to participate if there's been a meeting in the middle of the day uh, during the week if you're still working. Uh, so there will be a meeting next Sunday after uh, after the service. Any other announcements before we share the peace of the Lord? All right, well, let's stand and greet each other.
desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. At midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. As we await the day to come when Christ returns, we grow impatient as we wait. We become distracted by the things of this world that do not last and have given our attention and even devotion to things that are not beneficial to our faith. We grow impatient with others and we grow impatient with God himself. We come to think the day will never come when Christ will make all things new and have let our earthly circumstances cause faith to waver, the spirit to increase, and doubts to arise. For this we say, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a call to the remain servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our intro of Psalm 70. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back brought to dishonor, who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame, who say, Aha! Aha! May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say, Evermore, God is great. And I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever.
Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this morning is from Amos chapter 5, where we see the day of the Lord of justice. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we see Paul very clearly talking about the day of the Lord and what it will look like when Christ returns. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In anticipation of the Holy Gospel, please stand as we speak together in the Alleluia and verse. Alleluia, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. 25th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. And here we see Jesus tell the parable of the ten virgins. <laughs> Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were, who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we invite our children forward for a children's message.
Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. So what do we say? We say, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King. I think we need the congregation to join and sing too. <laughs> Let's all sing together. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. And I will sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King. Now that song is based on what we just heard, the parable of the, of the wise and foolish virgins. And the wise ones, they had, did they have oil? They had oil, right? And that meant they had faith. They were ready. They believed in Jesus. Well, what did we just sing? We were singing, give me oil in my lamp. We were praying to the Lord to give us oil. You know how the Lord strengthens our faith? By being right here. By being here in church. By hearing God's word. By receiving his gifts for us. That fills our lives with oil. That fills our lives with faith. So that we can keep singing Hosanna. So we can keep praising God's name and telling other people about him. So we thank our Lord that he comes to us each and every time we gather together and worship as God's people. And every time when we open up his word and read about it. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank, you thank you for giving us oil in our lamps. That is the gift of faith. In your name we pray.
Conapalooza, I noticed uh, a family uh, was outside putting up their outdoor Christmas decorations. Now the Grinch and me was kind of thinking, now, now why are they doing that? It's too early to be doing that. But, but honestly, maybe they really were just ready to be in the Christmas spirit uh, already. Perhaps they were wanting uh, to take advantage of the nice warm weather. As this time of year, of course, it can be in the 80s one day and then, you know, the 50s uh, the next. Uh, do any of you uh, have your Christmas decorations up yet? I don't see anybody, but that's okay. Well, growing up for us, it, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, uh, that was the day when we would get all the, the Christmas decorations up. Uh, you see, it didn't really matter, uh, you know, in Wisconsin uh, in November when you what day you picked to get everything up. It was already cold and miserable. Uh, you don't get 84 you know, one day uh, like we did a few days ago. And so I'd help my dad. I'd be plugging in the Christmas lights uh, to test them. We would patient, he would patiently go outside and, and put the, the lights on the front of the house and getting all the, the bushes covered uh, in colorful lights. Uh, then he'd come back in and we'd go through the arduous task of unboxing uh, the Christmas tree and getting all the artificial needles fluffed up, vacuuming up all of the needles that fell off the tree from that year, and of course again, then wrapping that tree up in lights. And usually on Sunday, we would uh, go ahead and, and hang all of our uh, Christmas ornaments, including a couple new ones uh, that my mom uh, would buy for my brother and I. So we were prepared at that point to then start thinking about uh, journeying through Advent and to celebrate Christmas when it got here. Now, friends, I say all of this uh, not to scare you with my, my grinchy uh, feeling, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, and, and trying to tell you when to put up your Christmas decorations, but I do want to ask you, are you prepared? Are you prepared for what God's Word is talking about today? As we said at the beginning of the service, these last three Sundays uh, of the church here invite us to ponder uh, a different preparation, not to remember uh, Jesus' first coming uh, at Christmas, but his second coming on the last day, and what that will be like. Are you prepared? And so this morning, we take a look at this reality from a bit of a, a different perspective, a perspective uh, from before Jesus came at Christmas for his first coming. We hear from the Old Testament prophet Amos. Now to begin, uh, I'd like you to look around our sanctuary for a moment uh, and see what your eyes uh, are drawn to. What does everybody comment on when they come to Holy Cross? The altar, right? So we look at the altar, we've got the four gospel writers, we've got Jesus in the center, uh, elevated of course, and he's holding uh, the whole world uh, in his hands. Uh, but over here on the prof or over here on the on the pulpit, do you know who's over here? You've got Jesus, of course, right there, uh, because Jesus is central to everything, and hopefully Jesus is always central to when we're preaching the word. But you've got the four major prophets: Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, I think Ezekiel, and Daniel. So you got those four, those four guys up here. Those are the four major prophetic books uh, in the Old Testament. You know who's not up here on this pulpit? Amos. Amos isn't up here on this pulpit because, well, he's considered a, a minor prophetic book in the Bible. Um, you don't see him up here, and, and really, we we treat this book uh, as such. You see, in our in our three year lectionary, we only hear from Amos. Five times, and if we're following the lectionary as, it, as it's uh, prepared for us. And this year, we only hear the word of the Lord from this prophet once, and that's today. Uh, you see, Amos was a shepherd uh, from Judah who was called to proclaim God's word uh, to the, the northern tribes of, of the people of Israel. He was a prophet during the time of the divided kingdom. Uh, when we had the northern tribes of Israel uh, and then a couple of the tribes of Judah down to the south. Uh, and so he's going in as a prophet during this divided kingdom. Uh, and he's, since he's from Judah, going up to Israel, he's proclaiming God's word as a foreign prophet. And what did Amos have to say? Well, a lot of doom and gloom. If 
you do a Google search uh, of the word Amos, you may come across um, sites that say that Amos means to carry or be carried by God. Some would, would say that it could also mean strong or brave. Those are kind of nice sounding, uh, but it's really a step away from the more kind of earthy Hebrew translation. Uh, and what is that? A burden or burden bearer. And if you read the book of Amos, you understand why Luther says he is rightly called Amos a burden because he denounces not only the nations, but also Israel and Judah, the people of the Lord, through almost the entire book. He is hard to get along with and he's irritating, Luther says. Are you prepared for the day of the Lord, for the day of his coming? If you ask the people of Israel uh, in Amos' day, uh, they say, you know, yeah, we are. I mean, see, look around. It's times of prosperity. When Amos is preaching, everything seems to be fine. There's no storm clouds of danger on the horizon. But what does Amos say? Why do you who desire the day of the Lord? Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. And what does he compare it to? As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met it. Some might say, out of the frying pan and into the fire, right? You go just from one trouble to the next, and the next isn't necessarily any better. Amos continues, where he went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. You go in thinking you can just, just breath for a moment, you put your hand up against the wall, trying to just take a moment to catch your breath, get out of that scorching heat, and all of a sudden, ah! Great pain. So Amos says again, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? Now as the people of Israel hear this word of the Lord, they are likely irritated. But they may be just dismissive, rolling their eyes. Come on, Amos. Look around. Don't you see? God's still blessing us. Sure, we sin against the Lord. Sure, we worship other gods. But hey, we keep them happy. We're still gathering together as his people. We're still feasting. We're still bringing offerings and singing. We're ready for the day of the Lord. What's the Lord's response? You heard it before. I hate. I despise your feast. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me birth offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your banned animals, I'm not going to look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, the melody of your harps. I will not listen. Hmm. Why is the Lord saying this? He's saying this because it's like when Jesus quoted Isaiah uh, to the Pharisees. Woe to this people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, the people of, at, of, of Israel at this time, they, they were prosperous. They weren't in war. Economically, things were good. But they were unfaithful. Their leaders led them to embrace the gods of, of other nations. Many of the people then, of course, went along with it. Uh, and the love for the Lord waned. And when love for the Lord wanes, love for others wanes too. The poor and needy are oppressed. Justice is perverted so that really it isn't justice at all. Women are dishonored and abused. And all the while, idol worship continues. This is what was going on in Israel at this time. And it's for this reason that the Lord says, but let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is what God wants for his people, that they would just do the right thing, that they would be just, and not just for a moment, and then go back to their idolatrous and unjust ways, but that it's just this continuous river of justice and righteousness flowing out from them. It's a powerful image, but Israel still thinks of their relationship with the Lord as transactional. We assemble and sing, we pray, and we give an offering, but then we go and do what we want, following our sinful patterns and ways. 
Uh, Amos reminds me uh, of a kid uh, who came up to his dad in a show uh, that we've been watching recently, uh, the other night, uh, Chicago Fire. Uh, anybody familiar with that show, Chicago Fire, a few of you? Uh, so in this episode, Kelly Severi, one of the main characters, has been contracted by a wealthy man to help restore a boat uh, that he had bought. Now, while the man is explaining the job to Kelly, his, his son comes up to him upset uh, because he thought he was getting pizza with his dad, uh, but it turns out his dad had just given him money to get pizza for himself as he was going to be going out for dinner with a girlfriend. And so the two start to, to argue uh, a little bit, and it gets a little bit more heated, and so the dad just gives the kid some money to hush him up so that he goes away, so that he stops complaining to him. Uh, and later in the episode, uh, while the dad is off somewhere else, the kid comes out to the garage and he sees Kelly uh, working, uh, scraping off some, some stuff uh, that was on the boat to prepare the surface for refinishing, and he invites the boy to join him, handing him a scraper, and the two work side by side, uh, forming a bond of sorts as they strip off the old gum that had formed on the boat's exterior. You see the connection, right? The son didn't want his father's money or the food uh, that it could buy. He wanted a relationship with his father. He wanted to be close to him, to have him right alongside him, to learn, to laugh, to live, uh, like he did with Kelly. But that's not what the father wanted. And that was what it was like for Israel with God. God wanted Israel to seek him and live. But Israel, now, nah, let's go through the motions. Pay the dues. Let's not see any connection between our worship and how we live our lives. It can be the same way for us, too, sometimes, can't it? All too often we can see our relationship with God as transactional rather than relational. God desires to be close to us, and our sinful nature says, Whoa, don't, don't you go get too, too close, God. Uh, like, look, here, here, I, I go to church. Uh, and I pray, and I bring an offering. Uh, uh, now just, just be happy with me. Run along now. Uh, box is checked, so now I can go on and, and do uh, what I really want to do. Focus on my plans or my own uh, sinful attitudes rather than on God's. Focus on my goals, not the care of others. Now friends, whether we come to church uh, at Christmas and then don't come back until Easter, uh, or if we go to church and then we don't come back until the next month or two, or if we go to church and then come back the next week, foolish we are uh, whenever we succumb to this kind of thinking. This is why uh, we sang in our hymn, Watch against yourself, my soul, uh, lest with grace you trifle. Let not self your thoughts control, nor God's mercy stifle. Pride and sin lurk within, all your hopes to shatter. Heed not when they flatter. Going back to that uh, Chicago Fire episode, it was actually in the next episode that, that the firefighters, uh, well, there's this, uh, this falling out between Kelly uh, and this boy's father, and, and the father uh, fires him uh, from, from the boat job. And later in the episode, the firefighters actually respond to that house uh, as the boat's garage is on fire. Uh, part of the house is engulfed in flames. Who set the fire? The boy. Now let me be clear so I don't get in trouble with our fire chief. I don't want Ken Steiger getting upset with me. Arson is wrong. But you can understand why that boy did it, right? His father had rejected his relationship with him as well as with the, with the man, Kelly, who he was starting to get close with, who was caring about him. And so the boy was unjustified uh, in handling things that way. The Almighty God of the universe, uh, who is holy, who humbled himself and became a child, is perfectly just on the day of the Lord to be as such to those who reject him in sinful unbelief. Yes, the, and yes, the reality is this. On their own, were the people of Israel prepared? Nope. Uh, and on our own, in our sin, we aren't either. I hate to say it, but, but again, Amos is a burden, 
Things don't get much better in his book. Eventually his words come true. Israel is invaded. They're taken captive, carried off to Assyria in 722 B.C. Later on, the tribe of Judah trying to hold on, but they can't anymore. As they've given over to unbelief, they're carried off into Babylon in 587. God's people are punished for their sins and unbelief. And it seems like that's just the end for them. And in our own lives, it can feel like the same as well. Maybe you've fallen into a familiar pattern of sin in your whole life. You know it's wrong, but you can't help yourself. Uh, and you keep giving in to temptation. You feel like, okay, this time, this time God's really going to let me have it. And you may have earthly consequences as a result of your sin. Hurt relationships, lost jobs, and more. But Amos, the foreign, irritating burden bearer that he is, ends his book with a promise of hope from the Lord himself. And you've got to look all the way back, uh, all the way to the very end, uh, to the last few sentences in chapter 9. But it's there. He shares this word of the Lord. And that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. And raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. How is the booth of David, the house of Israel, prepared, raised up, and rebuilt? As Amos' name means burden <coughs> or burden bearer. So that's what Jesus does. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2 that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It is this son of David who is also David's Lord who heals us by his wounds. Amos' words burdened the people of Israel. They didn't want to hear it, but the guilt was there and the shame uh, that would follow uh, by all of the generations after as they were carried off into exile, uh, it would be felt. But Jesus was broken. He was torn down and destroyed, taking on the burden of it all, all of Israel's sins and all of the world's sins, including yours and mine, uh, as he took that to the tree of the cross. By letting God's justice roll like waters as his wrath was poured out over him. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream as Jesus' side was pierced. Such amazing love. So that not only Israel, but also all the nations might be saved and brought to him. That said, of course, it wouldn't have meant anything without the resurrection. I had a guy over the other day who was trying to fix a problem with our, with our well tank uh, as it was leaking. Uh, he thought he could just patch it up with a weld, uh, but even after much effort, that weld, well, it didn't take. Uh, it's better than it was before, but it's still leaking, uh, to which afterwards, as he, as he had finished it up and looked at it, he's like, ah, oh, that's no good. Waste of my day. And he looked at me, waste of your day. Um, and, and he didn't charge me for, for it, so I was thankful for that, but Paul tells us uh, in Corinthians and us that our faith is in vain. This is all just a waste of time uh, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, confirming uh, that he had uh, fulfilled all that the law and the prophets had proclaimed. And so praise God that he has, hearing to the women at the tomb, the disciples in the locked room, and numerous times outside of there, including over 500 at one time, as the Apostle Paul declared. It is this crucified and risen Jesus that you are baptized into and who comes to meet you each week as we gather together here in the divine service. On your own, in your sin, you weren't prepared for the day of the Lord. But friends, in baptism, you are. And there's no charge. Because your story is joined to Jesus and his death and resurrection, as Paul says in Romans 6. This baptism destroyed the reign of Satan as king in your life, and now Jesus sits on the throne by grace through faith. And so friends, trust that promise of God that you are redeemed, restored, and forgiven. Our burdens uh, were borne by Jesus himself. Our houses of death repaired, raised up, and rebuilt in his life. 
his life that continues to come as we gather together here and receive his gifts. It is here where he calls us and equips us to be rivers, rivers of justice and kindness, streams of his mercy and grace to those who we see daily. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and lives in this Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen. At this time, please stand as we join together in confessing our common Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, 
Let's give a round of applause. Uh, 
that we would be equipped to do so, and that you would continue to bless all those who continue to serve, that you would keep them safe and in your care, and give them good courage as they continue to serve. Amen. 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 Jesus. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. We give thanks to you, gracious Father, that in our waiting upon you, we have been gathered together in fellowship at your table, with sins forgiven and faith nourished. We thank you for the foretaste of the wedding feast to come, when the Son of Man comes and we will live with you, who lives and reigns, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Watch therefore, for we know neither the day nor the hour. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.